Our first reading for today comes to us from 2 Samuel, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000 in all. David and all the people with him set out and went from Baal Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. They carried the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of, of Aninadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Aninadab, were driving the new cart. With the ark of God and Ahihu went in front of the ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. All right, our second set of scripture for today comes to us from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. One of the things that I've missed from COVID time has been weddings. Anyone else miss weddings? I mean, I guess they've been happening still, but they feel kind of like scaled back. They're even a little bit taboo for the last 18 months. Like, don't say you're having it. Definitely don't say you're like hugging anyone there. Keep mask on, all that kind of stuff. Weddings, I would say, are probably one of the more enjoyable aspects of ministry, especially when you get to officiate weddings, because you just get to meet so many different people. I mean, you get to meet the couples themselves, you get to meet their families, you get to meet their friends, you get to experience all the family drama. It's amazing. But because of all the, you know, creative spacing and the masking, it removed the pure gift of witnessing those raw, genuine smiles from family members as the happy couple becomes one. Now, fortunately, this month I had the joy of officiating not just one, but two weddings. One next weekend in Puerto Rico, that's cool, and another at the end of the month, both of which are largely what I guess you could consider normal, so to say, albeit smaller than they may have hoped for, and they're still being outdoors to try and be safe. In preparing for a wedding, a pastor gets to make this beautiful journey with the couple. You go from being complete strangers to sharing in some of the most intimate details of one another's lives as we together try to process how to create a successful marriage together. As a result, it's like you become a trusted member of their family, if even just for that one day. And it's always amazing. One of my favorite parts is getting to hang out with the hang out in like, the room beforehand with all the groomsmen ahead of time as they try and hype up and also calm down a really anxious and excited groom who just wants to get this over with. And then we all just get to walk out together as if we're there in it for one another to start the show. Undeniably, though, all of this aside, my favorite moment at every wedding is the formalities that come at dinner. I think part of it subconsciously is because it's the, uh, like the one time I get to step out of the spotlight and just kind of sit down and enjoy it as a spectator. But I love watching, for example, the couple's first dance. I love watching the, the mother-son and the, the father-daughter dance. My favorite one in recent memory in this past year has been, well, obviously that one. Mom, I know you're listening. That's clearly the best one. But my favorite one after that, second one, was this massive Harley Davidson guy. I want all of you to just use your best imaginations and come up with Harley Davidson guy, all right? Big, scary Harley Davidson guy, okay? Does it look like something like Hagrid from, from Harry Potter? Because that's somewhat what I'm trying to get at. 
big flowing hair, tattoos that are not just on like all the way down the arm and the hands that say like killer on the wrist, but like on the face and everything, you know? And then his daughter, who's maybe a third of his size, spinning in circles to John Mayer's uh, daughters and him just sobbing uncontrollably into her shoulder. And then the mo- these moments at weddings, I just find her magic. Because then after that, the whole room, most of which doesn't even know each other, right? They all pull onto the dance floor to join in the celebration for the rest of the night. For even just one day, the special part of being a pastor officiating a wedding is that it feels like your boundaries of what you consider family widens connected by nothing but the celebration of love itself. Now, in just a moment, we're going to dive into Scripture. That's kind of my job. I get paid to do that. But before we do, I want to invite you to think back to your own weddings. Wilson, I know it was recent, but, you know. Or, of course, if your wedding is a painful memory for whatever reason, I invite you to think of a wedding that has brought you joy. Perhaps one of your children, extended family, or of a friend. Everyone close your eyes. Nap time. Think now to that feeling of the first look when the ceremony began, the doors opened, and you saw your spouse for the first time on your wedding day. Can you remember how you felt? Now let's fast forward a little bit when the pastor invited you to seal the marriage with a kiss. What was that moment like? And now let's fast forward just a little bit more. Think of that first dance. What was the song you guys picked? Or picked for you, I guess. How'd you feel? All eyes on you? A little unsettling? What did you guys talk about, if anything at all? How many years ago was it? Take a moment and remember that and cherish it. All right, nap time's over. Wakey, wakey, kids. Just for fun, just for funsies. Would anyone be willing to share whatever song that was played at your first dance and why it was special to you? Anyone at all? Come on, we got one. There he is. What is it? Cheek to cheek? Oh, I love it. That's beautiful. Thank you. Anyone else? Which one? Silly love songs? Classic. (laughs) Excellent. All right, thank you. Thank you. So I think what's special is when we look back at these memories, when we share them aloud and we we connect with one another, we become an an extended family connected by nothing but the celebration and the remembrance of love and the widening of what the definition of family means. I have two scripture passages for us to consider today. The first of which was from Ephesians, and the second is from 2 Samuel. Ephesians is this interesting letter by Paul. Also, I should probably clarify, possibly not Paul. That's kind of beside the point. Don't want to get caught up in the weeds. Because while most letters of the day begin with praise for the one that the letter is addressed to, so for example, good morning. Who's going to be my special guest today? Foster's. Amazing to see you both. You look wonderful. I love the colors you got going on together. You, you just bring joy and happiness, and we love the selflessness you bring to our church. You guys are amazing and awesome and rock stars and woo! That's usually how Paul's letters begin. Those of you that have read Paul's letters or reading the Bible with us, you know how it is. He spends like a whole page and a half, two chapters, just praising the person. But this letter begins by saying, Blessed be the God of our Father, Jesus Christ. In other words, 
Paul is, in essence, writing this letter not to the church of Ephesus, despite the name, but to God. This particular style of writing is called a eulogy. Now, it's kind of weird because we think eulogy is in a whole different term and not usually in a happy setting where we're praising necessarily. But a eulogy is any style of writing or speech that is high praise for the benefactor. So in that light, in some ways, a eulogy at a funeral makes sense. We spend time celebrating the life of that individual. The purpose of Paul's letter is to thank God for God's power to save. But beyond that, it's also a letter that invites its readers to think of God on a cosmic level. Allow me just a moment to clarify. Those familiar with the Jewish faith might know that a huge tradition for the Sanhedrin, it's like the Congress of the Church, so to speak, was to commentate on the scriptures. They would read the scriptures, and then they would pray about it and pray about it, and they'd write a whole separate book called the Talmud, where they would try and explain what the scriptures mean. And their understanding, the more that we could dissect God, the more we could look at God under a microscope, the more we could understand the very DNA of God, we could better serve God. Those of us reading the Bible together might recognize some of these patterns in Paul's writing. We just are beginning to finish the book of Romans, for example. And he's often citing parts of the Old Testament to back up his claims on who God is. But in Ephesians, Paul isn't trying to convince anyone who God is, or what God stands for, or otherwise find the DNA of God. Paul is putting all of that aside for like one book, literally, which is probably why it's not Paul, and saying, think for a moment about God as large as the universe itself. And think that a God that big loves us. We will never understand God. God is too big, Paul's saying. But the only thing that we know, even if we don't understand it, is why God loves us. That God chose us before we were even born, he writes in verse 4. And God considers us part of God's own family in verse 5. Ephesians is also unique to Paul, which is also why most scholars argue it's not written by Paul, because it's different in the sense Paul is traditionally a very personal writer. He often writes in first person. He often writes talking of his own faith journey with God and his own role to play in God's work of redemption. Paul likes to put himself right there in the middle of the story. But have you noticed in today's reading the language of Ephesians? It's very corporate. Here again, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. Paul is saying to people that he might not even know in the church of Ephesus that God's love is for me. Heck yeah, it is. I'm Paul. It's definitely for me. But it's also for you. And like a wedding, Ephesians shows us that we are family, not by blood, but we are connected by nothing else than the power and the witness of love. There's a second really important thing that Paul, or whoever this is, is suggesting in their language. Have you noticed that in all of this, the author is not thanking God for things hoped for. It's not, blessed be the God and Father of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who we ask to bless us and give us the winning lottery ticket numbers so we can get every spiritual and physical blessing. I say that prayer every day. It hasn't worked yet. No, it's not things that a future that they're hoping God will accomplish. In the writing that Paul does here, he's saying, Blessed be the God and the Father of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has already blessed us. What Paul is implying time and time throughout all of Ephesians is that we should be responding to God's power of love and mercy in our lives for the things that God's already doing right now. 
right at the top of the service. What did I begin with? Has God been good to you? Amen? And what did I say? Is God going to do something good in this service for you? Amen? That's what Paul is saying to us. It's not just, hey, God, lottery numbers, please. It's, hey, God, my heart's beating and I'm seeing people in this room whom I love. Thank you. But the other side of that coin is, because I don't want to sound cross or shameful that we don't pray, you know, enough, is that Paul is also reminding us that we do not earn grace from God. I want you to hear that. You cannot earn God's grace. Why? Because it is already freely given. In fact, it was given before you even existed, according to Paul in verse 4. He chose us before the foundation of the world was even laid. You don't have to work for God's love. However, what Paul argues, and John Wesley by extension, is that once you discover this rich, bottomless well of love and mercy, you instinctively want to work harder to become a better person, not to earn that grace, but in order to fulfill it. You want to be a person of love because you found the one who is love itself. At the top of this message, I shared that my favorite part of any wedding are the dances. Which, if you know anything about me, whatsoever, that would be funny. Or ironic. I hate dancing. I want to make it very clear in case that didn't come across. I hate dancing. I take that back, kind of, a little bit. I love dances that have, like, choreography. Yeah. Like a musical? If you give me, like, eight months to figure that thing out, I'm on there, and I'm going to dance my heart out. And I know we're all white here, so we also love the electric slide, don't we? <laughs> any, any dance where it's the same three motions over and over again, we are going to be like, oh, I'm dancing. And then as soon as that stops and you have to kind of do your own thing, you're like, okay, I got really thirsty. And we're heading right back to our table, you know? I hate dancing in the sense that I've got two left feet and I am not creative enough to figure out what to do with my body. Anyone else with me? Give a man some solidarity here. But the truth is, I don't hate dancing, because I don't think anyone does. I think it's so baked into our human connection and our history to ever really rid ourselves of the joy that dancing brings. But if I had to guess, if you're a little like me, you hate the feeling of embarrassment, of shame, and nothing worse than the feeling of the whole eyes on me phenomenon, right? That feeling that the moment I start to awkwardly dance around, you know, that everyone and their mother is just going to drop whatever they're talking about and doing to look at me and be like, look at that dude. What is he doing? Is that a dance? Is that a chicken? What is that? And so to avoid all of that pure, full-body, joyful experience, I would rather just sit down than try and walk into embarrassment or shame. But at a wedding, weddings are kind of different. I'm able to put pause on all of that for just a single day. Because I think the sort of aura, if you will, not to be too spiritual or whatever, but there's this overwhelming feeling of love and joy in the room that nowhere else is greater than the power of shame or embarrassment. That the overwhelming feeling of love and joy is greater than the powers of shame and embarrassment. If anything's a prayer, I say, make thy kingdom come here on earth as is in heaven, when love is greater than shame. I think David felt that way in 2 Samuel. When he danced before the altar all night long, it said he got like his, his girded loins on, like he was in his dancing clothes, and he was ready to go all night long. He got the whole band to come out. He got the, the cymbals and the lyres and the harps and the whatever the other thing was. And they danced, and they danced, and they danced. And there were certain people who looked down on David. We didn't get that far, but uh, Mephal, I think her name is, she did not like David doing that. She was embarrassed by David because he was making a fool of himself. 
But he didn't mind those voices that thought he was being embarrassing because he was so consumed by the love that God had for him. He thought about all the good that God had done in his life, and he just began to smile. He thought about every promise that God had kept over the course of his life, and he smiled wider. He might even laughed a little. He thought about every prayer answered in one way or another. And with boundless joy, David gets up, and he danced, and he danced, and he danced. There's a final tradition that I love at weddings. I like weddings, in case you're curious. If you ever want a pastor that's really happy about weddings, hi. The anniversary dance. You know this one? This is that formality where all the couples come up and they dance with their partners and cherish memories of their own weddings. And then they're like slowly invited to trickle back to their seats based on how long they've been married for. You know, it's that chance where everyone gets to laugh because the newlyweds get to sit down after like 15 seconds, you know. Sit down if you've been married less than an hour. <laughs> and then everyone keeps going a little bit longer, you know, year, two years, three years, five years, ten years, whatever. And slowly more and more people return to their seats. And then it's just that, that emotion in the room changes. Because everyone kind of goes from like the laughter at all the people that are, you know, so cute and newly married to like awe and reverence when you start hearing numbers that just blow your mind, right? 40, 50, 60. And there's still people twirling around and we're trying to find that magic number where you're like, okay, sit down. We know you love each other. At our own, at our own wedding, the organist at the church I grew up in had been married to her husband at the time for 66 years. They were the last remaining couple on the floor. And Mackenzie took up her bouquet of flowers that she had from the service and gifted them to Barb in and, and a gesture to say, may we all experience a lifetime together as long as you two have. Thank you for this image of love. Like David, I want to invite you today to think about your relationship with God as an anniversary dance. Except this one's not a relationship that has lasted 66 years, but thousands upon thousands. It's a relationship that's timeless, cosmic in nature, greater than we could even begin to fathom or put together and understand. And as Paul writes in Ephesians, blessed be the God who blessed us, who chose us in Christ before the world itself, and who destines us not to be his friends, but his family. God, the creator of the universe, sees you as family. Before the world existed, before the trees of the forest, before the babbling of the brooks, before the sunrise and the moonlight and the majesty of the stars, God saw one thing that he loved most, and he knew I had to create a world that could fit because I chose you. So today, I want to invite all of you into that relationship with God. Now, growing up, I always found that language to be weird, right? I've got relationships, big homie. I've got my girlfriend. I've got my mom and my dad. I don't want to be that kind of thing with you. But then I started to think of it differently. I saw it kind of like that anniversary dance. Growing older with God. Spinning in circles and memories of all the wonderful ways that God has moved in my life. And I trust in your lives as well. Being up there with God, dancing away, not worrying anything about the eyes looking on me, because I'm looking into the eyes of someone who loves me, and who values me, and who cherishes me. Someone who created a world very for me. I think of all the places that God has taken me to live. All the jobs that God has taken all of us to work at. The forgiveness that we've received, and by extension given. The beauty of waking each day knowing that you are loved, cherished, and valued as perfectly and wonderfully made. And that's what it means to be in a relationship with God. To not be afraid to dance, because the power of love is greater than the forces of embarrassment or shame. So, if this is the case for you, I want to invite you to stand as a witness to all of us in this room, if your relationship with God 
has been a crucial part of your life. Or, if you are ready to go from just a churchgoer to a Godgoer. If you are no longer bound by the feelings of shame or embarrassment, or not feeling like you're good enough in the morning, I want you to stand before the God who calls you beloved each and every day, even when you don't feel it. To the God who chose you before you even understood what this world would be. If you are consumed by what the power of love can do for a broken and a healing world, and we know that it's broken, yes, but we know that God has the power to heal and rebuild it, I want you to stand in the majesty of a God who proclaims that witness to each of us. And when a whole room stands together, it is a witness to the power of what love can do. It is a witness that family is bigger than blood because we are all chosen by God to be his family members. Let us pray. God, we thank you this day for the boundless ways that you've moved in our lives and have revealed love to us. We thank you for the people in our lives that help us to love like Jesus once loved. God, we think of all those in this room that might be saying yes to you today and committing their lives to a deeper and a more fulfilling relationship with you. And for that, we come together in celebration. Help us to experience life with you that is so grand, so fulfilling, so empowering that we, like David, can do nothing but dance and twirl in full body joy. So may it be so. Amen.